Hello and welcome. My name is Duncan McGregor. Today I'm giving the second half of the talk that I gave at Lambda Days just a few weeks ago. As with that one, I'm going to share with you a little Lisp flavored airline, extempore, and generative music. However, in this talk, I will be focusing much more upon the details of the Undertone project itself from the perspective of both a musician and an engineer. In particular, the need for a reliable, soft, real-time system capable of speaking multiple protocols, of creating servers or connecting to them, and of being able to continue operations even as parts of the system encounter unrecoverable errors and must be restarted. Here are some superficial bullet points about me and some more relating to music. If I can draw your attention to the end of that list, about six and a half years ago at OzCon 2014, I met Andrew Sorensen, pictured here, after his extemporary live coding performance keynote. And yeah, that's me, the one nearest him. Andrew and I talked about live coding, including my interest in using LFE OTP along with extemporary. I believe he also mentioned previous conversations between himself and Joe Armstrong about extemporary and Erlang, including some possibilities for collaboration. I started using extemporary immediately after Andrew's performance when he shared his keynote code with me. Yet, life pulled me in other directions. Last year, however, I picked it up again. After Alexander Lisecki's blog post, which covered sound generation in Erlang, I ported his code to LFE and sufficiently re-inspired proceeded to create the Undertone project. Undertone came about due to my need to control synthesizers, both hardware and software, and run services. For all the separate systems I wanted to manage, a beam language felt like the perfect match. I started reading everything I could on Erlang and music, retracing Joe Armstrong's steps from the mid-2000s up until a few short years ago. As such, one of the first features that landed in Undertone was support for open sound control, or OSC. This allowed me to run several of Joe's code samples from within a structured project using a custom backend for Super Collider. Ultimately, though, I became frustrated by my admittedly subjective perception that Super Collider seems to lack an element of musicality, a feeling that echoed my previous experiences with it. Remembering my wonderful time with Extempore, I turned there next. Within a few days, I'd added a new backend for it in Undertone, one that allowed me to run Extempore code from LFE. The real why behind Undertone isn't a battle of backends, though. The heart of the matter is what I wanted to do with it. In my practice sessions with guitar and synthesizers, I wanted to be able to quickly write just a few lines of code for some ambient backing sounds or chord progressions against which I could practice scales or experiment with intervals and counterpoint. After so long in the software industry, I'm just much, much faster at writing code than sitting down with a sheaf of blank staves and writing notes. So it needed to be in a language in which I had fluency. And if I'm going to be writing code in my spare time, it needed to be a language that I love and have fun, have fun using. Ergo, LFE. Above and beyond that, I needed to be able to control external processes running on the operating system, restarting them as necessary. There are a lot of features listed here, but that one was a biggie for me, having run into it early on. I did a lot of experimentation with different MIDI drivers, software synthesizers, VST plugin hosts, and ended up having various applications or their supporting processes crash. Sometimes, days of work, where I'd invested my time in long chains, and trial and error, were lost, all because just one component I'd been experimenting with was unstable or wasn't designed to do the crazy things I was asking of it. And to that point, I also needed to manage state in a sane manner. As you are all assuredly aware, the points above and those in the previous slide are features readily available in OTP and to those beam languages which offer airline interoperability. It is for these reasons that Undertone was born, created in LFE and built upon the foundation of Erlang and OTP. Undertone is an idea and a set of needs which depend upon multiple systems in order to realize the goal of making music reliably. Here is a now classic beam depiction of the Undertone stack. And here is a diagram that is perhaps a bit more useful, a view of the system configured to use the extempore backend with all of the high-level communications involved. Extempore runs a TCP server to which we can connect 
and from there gain access to the operating system's audio layer, MIDI devices, and the like. Undertone spawns the extempore binary as a managed OS process, starts a TCP client, and optionally starts open sound control clients and servers. All of these go into a supervision tree that will restart these components should one or more of them be pushed beyond their limits, all without crashing the Erlang VM. In addition to extempore support, I'm working on a new backend using two CLI tools created by the head of software engineering at Moog, Geert Bevan. These are Erlang ports opened to long running OS processes. I had hoped to have this ready to show you today, but I instead chose to use that time to create a new demo using a sampled grand piano, which you'll be hearing in a few minutes. Back to the extempore backend. If we zoom in on the section within the dashed purple border, we can see a little more of how undertone pulls systems together. This particular view of the architecture shows which undertone, LFE, and OTP components are connected to each other and how. The gray box in the middle right is what you will be seeing during the demo. It represents a custom extempore REPL written in LFE that has its own commands that are separate from the LFE REPL. Note that everything within the purple dash boundary except the extempore component has been written in LFE. Here's a quick textual summary of all those diagrams. And here's a reminder on what we've covered so far. Now let's take a closer look at Undertone's supervision tree. This is of special importance for Undertone. It is the core of what Undertone uniquely offers to the world of programmatic and generative music. Here is the current Undertone supervisor init function. Based upon OTP release configuration, sys.config values, the appropriate child processes will be created, some specific to a backend. This is, of course, easily extendable to any backend or other related service which might be needed in the future and which will need to be started at this time. When undertone is run with the extempore backend, it supervises the general undertone server common to all backends, a specific server for the, for the extempore backend, and then an additional server that manages the extempore REPL sessions. The backend specific server then opens an Erlang port to manage the OS process in which extempore, the binary, is running. Things are a little bit different for the Bevan backend. While there's still the general server and a backend specific server, there is no custom REPL. This backend doesn't have its own language, unlike extempore, so we don't need one. We get to use the regular LFE REPL. Also, there are two OS processes for the separate binaries which comprise this backend, a MIDI tool for sending MIDI messages and another for receiving them. I'm running short on time and want to leave enough room for the demo and walkthrough, so I'll breeze past these slides. They simply give more details about the types of clients and servers used in Undertone. It's all standard fare though, nothing too remarkable, and I can cover any questions around these during the Q&A. I do want to pause here though. Of all the languages where I have had to utilize their support for inter-process communication or reading from and writing to pipes, every single one of them was a bit painful, with the notable and laudable exception of Erlang. As much as I love OTP and regale non-beam programmers with the virtues of its behaviors and callbacks, on the Undertone project I have become deeply enamored with Erlang ports. Though I've used them before, this is the first time they have formed the very basis of a project, and working with them has been a delight. That being said, there are some problems one encounters when shutting down an OTP application that has spawned long-running executables. And to be fair, managing the lifetime of an OS process is arguably not the purview of a simple low-level library. Fortunately, the Erl exec project does support this, and with an API that is just as simple to use as Erlang ports, and Erl exec uses Airlink ports under the hood too. Which brings me to something else I wanted to call out. Special mention for a few of the key dependencies upon which Undertone relies, and without which the task of realizing the vision of the Undertone project would have taken much more time, or might simply have been too daunting, given all the extra stuff that would have had to been done. Side note here, Andrea's post is one of the best demonstrations I've yet seen for Gen State M. And a special mention of just one of the many contributions made by Fred to the airline ecosystem. And another update on the ground we've covered so far. 
it would be a shame to give a beam talk without actually doing a dialectical comparison. So here is something for those who have not seen any LFE before. This is some syntax in Erlang and LFE for function head, pattern matching, and recursion. For a comparison of slightly more involved code, here is a partial implementation of the iconic OTP supervisor in Erlang. And the same for LFE. Back to undertone. When using the extempore backend, there are another two languages to consider, both derivations of scheme. This is extempore's xtlang, which provides low-level access to all aspects of the extempore system, essentially a thin scheme layer over extempore's low-level C code. And this is extempore's higher-level language, a derivative of tiny scheme. This is what most extempore performers use, and is what you'll see me using in the custom REPL during the demo. One of the benefits of using Undertone with the extempore backend is the REPL. It provi it's provided for extempore because extempore proper doesn't actually have a REPL of its own. The standard way of interacting with it is by means of a text editor, such as Emacs or VS Code, which are capable of sending scheme forms to the extempore TCP server for on the fly compilation. Calling the start function as pictured here is how one enters the, this REPL. One may type help uh, to display the list of possible commands. And as an example, here is the session command, sesh. Um, and it displays an indexed list of all extempore forms and REPL commands entered during the given session. Additional commands are available for rerunning one or more of the previous entries in this list. A final note on this topic. The extempore REPL was implemented in LFE using the classic approach invented by members of the Lisp community in the early 1960s. It is the famed read, eval, and print loop, as you can see here. Okay, time for the demo. A note of caution, though. Here there be dissonance, sometimes for effect, and sometimes by unhappy accident. Due to the random nature of generative music, every performance is different, often very different. The key thing to keep in mind while listening is to think of the possibilities of what can be done, not the limitations of a given performance. There are two parts of the demo I'll be giving you. The first is a recording comprised of piano adaptation for what was originally a piece for banjo and orchestra. This is then used as the basis for some generative techniques, utilizing Markov chains for control of chord progressions, melody generation, volumes, and sustain. After that is the second part, which walks through those generative techniques step by step. So without further ado,
Let's explore how to arrive at a finished piece like that from an admittedly odd collection of corns. While under tune, the next tempore are starting up. Here are the simplified chords for our starting tune, LFE's unofficial theme song. And here are some brief analyses of the modes and durations. Undertone is ready to go, so let's start our custom REPL and load our files. Here's the setup for the MIDI. And then next we'll paste the code for our Markov chains for the initial chord transitions and volume. Here we have defined a very simple chord builder that merely wraps Extempore's own chord building function. We'll be adding to this shortly. And this is our starting progression function, the foundation of our piece. It's responsible for playing the notes and preparing the inputs for the next iteration. This includes getting the next chord to use, the next duration of play, and how loudly it should be played. And now you can hear the progression starting. This is very plain, simple chords and transitions from one to the other with no dynamics. Let's change that by updating our volume transitions and adding another chain for situations where we want to have the possibility for more dramatic shifts in volume between notes. To take advantage of this, we'll have to override our default play note function that we've saved in our funds.xtm file and update it to use our new volume Markov chain. We can make things more interesting for our bass notes by conditionally arpeggiating the notes of our chords. This function keeps track of the duration of each note played in the arpeggio and will bail if the total of those durations exceeds the time allotted for the given chord. We need to update the progression function for this. And we can add some more spice by randomly incorporating syncopations into our arpeggio, delaying the moment that the first note plays. You can hear the arpeggio starting there. Now it's time to pull the right hand into the mix. We'll start with a simple melody function that will either create a chord, just like we did for the left hand, or select a set of notes taken from the original piece create a new function for playing the randomly selected notes for melody. Whatever notes get selected with the build melody function will either be played randomly one at a time until the time is up for the given chord, or it will play no note at all instead inserting a rest. We have to update our progression function to support playing melodies now. You can hear it kick in right there. Let's make our melody builder more interesting. This function creates melodies with different numbers of notes it will iterate through, and a different high and low range that will be used for however long the current chord is played. And we'll have to update our melody player to use this. And since it's a little bit busy now, let's simplify the note timings to play each note a little longer. approaching the end of our piece, so let's soften the volumes. And this is also a good time to demonstrate how to depress and lift the sustain pedal. We'll add another Markov chain for the transitions where the pedal release should occur. Then in our progression function, we'll send MIDI change control messages for the pedal.
Let's up the dissonance for a modern classical feel. Here we'll take the notes that directly follow each other in the original piece, and we'll update the play melody function. This causes the source notes to be preferred, but if the current note doesn't have an original transition, then we'll select a new one from our random melody notes instead. You can hear that dissonance starting to kick in now. Finally, we'll drop our volume in more and reduce the total number of chords possible for our transitions. And now we'll update the left hand to go back to simply playing chords, no more arpeggios. Slow things down some more and reduce the total chords to just one. As you can see, that Markov chain now has all transitions going to the minor chord. And you can see in the logs below that it's starting to hit just that one minor. We'll let that play for a few more, and then update the transitions to go to a chord for which there is no transition. It'll effectively finish our piece for us after it plays that chord. And there you have it. If you experienced any network dropout or the sound quality over Zoom was not to your liking, you can view the demo on YouTube at this link. So what's next for Undertone? I have created project tickets for efforts such as finishing the new MIDI-only Bevan backend, deeper support of extemporary and native LFE, live capture of music recorded as LFE data structures, digital signal processing from LFE, more support for open source synthesizers, exploring the collaboration possibilities with the distributed platform that LFE offers, and lots of practical use in generative music, music theory, etc. And finally, just making long form pieces for the pure enjoyment of listening. And for the sake of completeness, here are the checked off topics we've covered. Special thanks to the Ent artist and the original creator and performers of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy theme. Once the talk slides are published, you can visit the project-related links. And with that, I can field any questions you may have. Thank you. That was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing, Duncan. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, Richard, would you like to join us first? Yeah, okay. Uh, so in the Sonic Pi project, which I'm sure you know of, there's a an Erlang-based uh, OSC routing and, and uh, timing engine, if you may, that was uh, originally written by Joe Armstrong. So is that something that could be of, of use in your project as well, as a component for something? seem to have lost. Can you still hear me? OK. Yeah. OK, good. There, I have you back. OK. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, OSC support was the first thing that was added to Undertone. Um, so using it as uh, as part of any Sonic Pi project would just be a matter of connecting to it as a client. Uh, that being said, uh, I have not explored the source that ended up in the Sonic Pi project. Yeah, that's what you're talking about, right? Sonic Pi? Okay, I haven't explored that source that was done. I've only looked at Joe's code that he did separate from the project. So I don't know what that would look like, but there's a very good chance that it could be incorporated. Or in fact, uh, any interesting things that he might've done in there, I could pull out and put into the standalone Erlang uh, library that I've got for OSC. Um, that was one of the dependencies that I'd mentioned in the slide 
that was actually taken from a very old Erlang project that uh, has been updated over the past 10 to, I think 10 years and more recently five years. And it hadn't been updated since. And so I did a bunch of updates there and there's a good chance that Joe's stuff could be pulled into there as well. Yeah. So uh, after Joe died, uh, I and a couple of others have helped out on that code and uh, recently, um, uh, sorry, just, um, well, the Sonic Pi maintainer, uh, <laughs> sorry, just forgot to think. Sam, yeah, Sam. Uh, he's been uh, adding some stuff to it. So so it's in much better shape now than it was originally if you looked at it further back. So it's a pretty nifty little, well, engine for keeping track of routing OSC messages, if that's useful to you. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the more, uh, the more hardware that is OSC enabled, um, the more useful this becomes, obviously. So, or, or software, in fact. Um, but uh, Ardor, the Ardor uh, digital audio workstation is open, so open source and anybody can download and use it. Uh, compiled, it's free. If you want to buy the binaries, you have to pay. But regardless, it offers OSC support and you can control faders and everything. You can do all sorts of phenomenal things uh, from code uh, as if you had hands on multiple hands on a device. So, yeah. In case folks don't know about this. Look at the questions right. here. Thank you. We have Nuku. Nuku, you are with us, right? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Well, it, it's a very great project. Um, I'm there to ask how it would work in a kind of a distributed environment, like with different people playing from different locations, something like that. How would that work out? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, like the best question you could have asked about this sort of project. It really, it would push uh, this whole effort to a, a very next level situation. And in fact, would make a phenomenal uh, demonstration to have three people up on stage, each with their uh, own clients, all connected to uh, essentially a conductor um, and uh, of, of uh, any sort of distributed uh, platform like this that is able to run music. So yeah, there'd be several things that would have to be tackled first. Uh, a lot of it could actually be done right now, but you, um, might want to formalize some of the coordination uh, in um, maybe even a DSL actually, to be honest, uh, because there's a lot of work that an individual has to do when doing a live performance on a composition like this. And if everyone's doing it together, you wanna make sure you're really following the same patterns. So I created the little DSL that wraps a bunch of these uh, extemporary commands together. And, uh, and one of the things I was think, actually thinking about this just the other day, what would be phenomenal is to actually have, um, I'm thinking Project NX here, um, and maybe some sophisticated near real-time Markov chain generation, to have a separate process that's running, Erlang process, observing each individual who is making their own music on the fly, observing the statistical patterns they're engaged in, and inserting that, you know, via distribution, inserting that into the other's performances so that it's not just, you know, your, your common practice era, like that I had like, actually though, this isn't common practice era, this was based on the Eagles and they didn't follow common practice pro, um, patterns, more modern. But anyway, uh, you're not just following some particular pattern, you're actually creating, you know, markup chains on the fly or doing machine learning on the fly based on what the other performers are doing and then integrating that into your own node. So yeah, there are some absolutely brilliant possibilities here that would be a delight to explore. Great question. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Robert Berding has a question, and then I can see also another hand. Who's that guy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just had a technique. You were changing functions on the fly. That's right. So they were being interpreted in the REPL. That's right. Uh, okay, wait, uh, let's, um, so yeah, this, there's a great, uh, I, I think we're, you're not quite to your question yet, but let me add a clarification point to help make your question a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. In the same way that LFE holds the state and the environment, yeah. um, uh, Extempore has its own environment that it maintains on the compiler server. And so okay. the REPL is one thing in Erlang, it's split across two separate things in uh, under, undertone for the Extempore REPL. So there is a, a history that's man, maintained and the ability to enter forms and in, in, in the REPL itself that's actually doing the read of Allen print. But the, the, the environment of the state of the system itself is not there in the REPL. It's actually in the remote server. So it's this weird sort of Frankenstein. Okay, so you were, these, these functions were being run in, 
not in the ripple, but in this in the server itself. Right. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah, they were, were compiling. Were they interpreted? Were you compiling them down to something? Or yeah, unbelievably, that is compiled on the fly. It's a very, very fast, um, um, okay. uh, highly optimized compiler. Yeah, because you didn't notice any delays or anything like this in the music. I mean, the music just kept on coming the whole time while you were changing the, how it was being generated. That's right. And there is, there's one optimization that's made for this. And it's honestly, I was, when I first started the project, I just started extempore uh, on the, on the terminal, you know, just by my, my hand. Um, I ended up having to make an optimization that made startup a little bit more tricky. And if anybody were to come in and start playing on the project, they would have been like, oh my gosh, why does it sound so bad? And I was like, oh, you have to start it a special way. I was like, you know what? If you have to start a special way, might as well throw it in a supervision tree, start mm -hmm. it with appropriate defaults, maintain it here locally. That optimization gets to what you're talking about. And that is basically reducing the number of music frames. So you're kind of quantitizing um, what the compiler server is doing with music timing. And that's why it sounded so good and on time because it's not trying to do a thousand frames in, in a given second. It's actually only trying to do 64. And so you end up with okay. a much better synchronization. Okay. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. That was great. <laughs> And it worked, yay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I always get worried when people use my code for doing something serious, <laughs> even if it's fun serious like this, but yes. Okay. Oh, okay. So wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Robert Carbone, you're also with us now, right? Hmm? Uh, the other Robert is with us now. Oh, yeah, yeah. He also I'm, has I'm, a question. I do actually, uh, that reminds me, Joe always used to say, that's why people like Erlang, because it just works. Let's you pick it up and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say thank you. That that was, it's awesome. That what you just made is incredible. Oh, uh, yeah, R really. I, I, I was, I started Erlang like four or five years ago and I started to work with Joe because I was playing piano with him on this, but I was too too new to actually be able to hack the drivers and whatnot. The more I looked at the, it's just, as a, as a beginner, you can't do that. Yeah, and um, yeah, so just thank you first off. And uh, as a question, do you have a roadmap of where you want to go with this? Because I'd love to help out in some capacity, but I don't want to uh, you know, branch the project. I'd love to, there's a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to do with this one. And, and, and just jump in here too with uh, Joe, he'd be so happy because he was saying that the core of a piece of music is an ostinato. And the fact that you had that in the code and you were actually bringing the ostinato into the, the real time programming that it just, I need to dig into it, but it looks like the right way to do it. So like, cool. Like, <laughs> that's so delightful yeah. to hear. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of funny too. It sort of felt like after not doing extempore for a while to be able to make these talks, uh, you know, using the beam was quite a delightful conclusion to that conversation that uh, Andrew Sorensen and I first had at OzCon where we talked about Joe and Joe's ideas and plans around music and that he had talked to Andrew. And so it sort of felt like, oh, that, that initial possibility of a promise with Andrew about, you know, Joe and OTP and Erlang it finally came through, you know. So yeah. Anyway, it's a real nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, back to your other, your first question. I've already forgotten it because. Oh yeah, the uh, a timeline or, or uh, next oh, yeah. next steps, next actions on the entire project. What do you see? Absolutely. Um, so yeah. right now, it's currently in um, the development cycle for the 0.4.0 release, and it's all broken down by milestone. And I've got tickets, a bunch of tickets for that. I've also got um, an 0.5.0 uh, milestone that I'm planning, and with tickets already put in there. So yeah, it's fairly well mapped out on the project. Um, one of the things that I'm really gonna enjoy doing, so I, um, how are we doing on time? Quick quick check. Uh, yeah, we got two, a few more, two more minutes. Perfect, okay. Um, huge fan of music theory. I'm finally getting back into it after many years. Uh, I'm following the course, uh, the courseware, the, the um, textbooks from, um, uh, not Carnegie, but Juilliard. Juilliard School of Music has a beautiful set of texts. I'm using that as a basis of inspiration for creating a book, um, a Git book type uh, book for uh, LFE, so Beam, uh, and music using Undertone. So that's a huge project with a lot of great stuff to explore, um, a lot of excellent opportunities for actually creating music, demonstrating uh, these various uh, concepts real time, you know, for, for people to get mm -hmm. their hands into. And so that's one of the many things that are, that are going to be going on for the project, but I wanted to mention that too, given your interests. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a music student of Stetson University myself. So, uh, yeah, music theory all the way through. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Love it. All right. All right, well, thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. This is it. I mean, the time is up, but again, thank you so much. It was an awesome, awesome.
presentation. And Robert Berding, would you like to add some closing marks? I think this was fantastic. I think it's um, one of the more fun things I've seen uh, seen it being used for. And I know <laughs> Joe loved music, and he would have definitely wanted to hear this, right? No, no, no worries about it. No doubt about that, because he was going to be really into that. So yeah, it was great. It's fantastic. It all done it. It all works. Eh? <laughs> My stuff works. That makes me happy, right? <laughs> I noted, I, no doubt about Duncan's stuff. My stuff, oh, yeah, that works. Great. It's good. And um, yeah, I, will, I, I keep working on other feet and improving that. And he's improving the music side. So it's fantastic. Thank you. Yep. Great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yes, bye.